a lot of teenagers struggle to know where they fit in. That's true for teenagers in the U.S., and it's also true for teens in Pakistan. But for Christian teens there, the struggle can be even greater. Brother Aaron says in Pakistani churches, young people often feel like this. We are from this land. We are from this country. If we are not, then where do you really belong to? So these are a lot of questions which happen. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help right now on The Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Welcome again to The Voice of the Martyrs Radio. My name is Todd Nettleton, and we are in our studio this week with a guest from Pakistan. We are going to call him Brother Aaron. Those of you who are longtime VOM Radio listeners, you know that often uh, we have just one name guests. Brother Aaron is one of those. We want to protect his identity and his security. In fact, uh, the voice that you hear is going to be altered so that you won't be able to recognize who he is. Brother Aaron, welcome to Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Thank you, brother. It's honor to be here. One of the verses that you shared with our VOM staff this week was 1 Corinthians 16, 9. A wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Uh, Paul, obviously writing to the Corinthians about that, it seems like, though, that's a pretty good description of Pakistan right now. Pakistan is a restricted country in many ways, but at the same time, it's an open country in many ways because uh, uh, we never had an issue with, from the government. The government uh, never placed any obstacle for the Christians to worship within their churches, and they never have stopped you doing people their uh, Christian activities in their premises. So in that case, it's an open country, but yes, there is a law. There is a law uh, for street evangelism. There is a strong law enforcement for if you go outside the church and try to reach a majority people in the country, then you have to pay the penalty. But there are a lot of fanatic groups in the country, a lot of uh, militants who, who wants to stop uh, the spread of uh, gospel in the country. In that way, I would say the door is still open, and, uh, it, and it's how we use it wisely and how we reach people in the country with different strategy and different methods. Uh, but yeah, the problems, obstacles, uh, these things are always there. And one needs to be wise while well, address them. What are some of the areas where you feel like the door is wide open? What are some of the ways that Christian ministry is happening right now in, in Pakistan? Pakistan is a country where we have young people under the age of 30. They are like 60%, I would say, f- uh, for the whole population. Wow. And these young people are struggling with a lot of their questions. And when you talk with them, uh, they are always digging deep to see how, how can someone help them to answer their questions. And many a times they look into the best teacher these days, which is Google and uh, the social <laughs> media, and they find their answer according to their, their search. So they are looking for the answers, and somehow uh, that's a vital age to be addressed. And I feel like that's a great opportunity for the churches for the ministries in the country to reach people who are under the age of 30. And secondly, the uh, the statistics say, the survey says that people who accept Christ at early age, uh, the possibility is they tend to walk with, uh, with him for the rest of their life. We're talking today with Brother Aaron. He is a gospel worker in Pakistan. Uh, Brother Aaron, one of the other things that, that you said as you talked to our staff yesterday was that persecution— uh, is kind of like the in the air around us as Christians in Pakistan. Explain that a little bit. What did you mean by that? Well, many times we see the persecution is only when someone is beaten badly or, or killed uh, by the mob or by others. But there are different levels of persecution, I would say. Talking about countries like I come from, uh, uh, when I said the persecution is in air, when you go out of your house, you, you when you walk for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, you meet a lot of people around you. Uh, you face a lot of uh, discrimination. You face a lot of disturbance from them uh, uh, because they would probably call you 
with different names. When you go to the restaurants in some cities, some places, if they find out you are Christians and they would probably try to separate your utensils and the plates you're using, the glasses you're using. So that is a other level of persecution as well. And when you apply to the certain jobs in the government sector, sometimes being Christian, you are discriminated. Although the government says that there is a special quota for the minorities, but uh, beside that quota, you know, you always struggle. And I remember 30 years back, 40 years back, Many people, uh, Christian families, started putting their kids' names. Um, uh, they're not using any Christian names uh, anymore because they thought they will be easily recognized by the by the uh, authorities that they're Christian. Mm-hmm. So they started putting their Muslim names as well, so or rather rather secular names. When you go to uh, to the market, sometimes people talk with each other about. Oh, Christians are like that, and they use typical words for Christian. Or oh, Christians are churas. Chura word is very. It's like a, a very bad word for Christians when they hear in the market. In the classroom, the kids when they're Christian, they are put to the corner and they are uh, treated differently. For nowadays, uh, in many places, young girls and young boys at an early age, they are uh, they struggle to share their faith openly with them or share share their religion openly. And it varies, but it's uh, it's like a, uh, you can't say it's all over the country. In some uh, big cities, some places, it's the people are open to share their faith. Uh, but majority of the country, which is rural setup, that's where they face a lot of problem all the time. And sometimes, by the end of the day, when they come back home, they don't want to go back to their school the following day. They don't want to go to their jobs the following day. Because they 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 are treated so badly in different ways, it breaks their heart. And but living in that country, I think we are living with it now, and we face this from the early childhood. So it it has become part of our life, and we sometimes we have no choice. We are helpless, and we simply ignore it now. But for the for the young kids who are growing right now, they feel pretty insecure in the in that situation, and they think. We are from this land. We are from this country. If we are not, then where we really belong to? So these are a lot of questions which happens. It seems like just the weight of oppression, like everything is is five times harder if you're a Christian than it would be if you were part of the majority religion. Yeah, that's that's right. And that's why uh, there are a lot of cases happening where uh, young girls especially, they are converting to uh, just, just to make life easier. Just to get all the b- blessings, I would say, all the things which can, they can enjoy. So uh, that that happens. Uh, but there are a lot of strong believers over there, bold believers. They still live and they are uh, facing those persecution levels each and every day. On the daily basis, I would say they are facing those. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Brother Aaron. He is a gospel worker from Pakistan uh, Brother Aaron, hearing hearing about what life is like for Christians in Pakistan, uh, I would think the the need for discipleship and the need to strengthen the faith of especially young people, strengthen their faith, strengthen their understanding of the scriptures is just vital to helping them continue to function under the pressure that they face every day. Yeah, I think of uh that's the age where people or, kid, or young people start thinking differently, and that's where they make a lot of decisions, good and bad. And I think that's the right age where church needs needs to be very active, and church needs to pay more attention. I think that's where we are struggling at the moment. So, a country like Pakistan, or it's I think it's all over the world. We the, the churches are tend to be more focused on adults, and there are some uh, programs or some opportunities for young people. I I think uh, that's where we are missing uh, uh, the bus or missing the opportunity. In that case, I I say we in Pakistan need to be more focused on reaching young people, especially the youth of the country, and uh, and disciple them properly because they are looking uh, for different answers at the same time. And it's not only the spiritual growth they need. I guess they need holistic development. That covers all other development elements in their life. And I think one church needs to be very intentional in fulfilling all those requirements for the youth. We have talked about the sort of air of persecution, the kind of general oppression that lies over 
Christians there. What about the experience of someone who was born in a Muslim family and has changed and is now a follower of Christ? Does persecution look different for them, or is it essentially the same? What is their experience like? I think many of uh, of young people or uh, people who accept accepted Christ, uh, they either had to leave their families or leave their cities or have to leave their area to be safe. Otherwise, the family would never appreciate what they have done. And in many cases, uh, the family really want to kill them or they don't want to see them and that because they have brought a disgrace to the family and uh, they have chosen the wrong path according to them. In that case, they are they f- they keep their identity confidential in many p- ways, and they don't expose it, or either they live two lives. They live uh, the life with their families and also the life with the Christ uh, in disguise. So that's uh, how it is. The other sad so, part is. So what I hear you saying is, it's not they're not necessarily worried about the police or the government. They're actually the the persecution is from their own family members. I think the persecution mainly comes from the families and from the people. As I mentioned earlier, the government always tried to be on the good, in the good books, and so they would never do such kind of activities, and they will never bring persecution to the Christians or to the minorities. They will always try to solve it nicely and wisely. So the persecution always comes from a few of the fanatic groups in the country. I wouldn't say not every party, Muslim party in the country is like that, but there are a few elements where they ignite the fire in the country and they encourage. Many of the Muslims I know, they're good friends. They understand and they respect it, but there are majority as well as on the other side, they are uh, maybe manipulated by their, their mullahs and they just want them to, uh, you know, uh, react on these issues. Brother Aaron is our guest today here on The Voice of the Martyrs Radio. We're disguising his voice to protect his security as he serves the Lord in a country where Christians are a tiny minority. One of the, maybe the most famous case of persecution in Pakistan is Asya Bibi. The whole world knew about Asya Bibi. How was that? dealt with in Pakistan, the fact that the the rest of the world was talking about Asya Bibi, the rest of the world wants her to be released. Did that help her case or did it cause uh, maybe more difficulties for her? I think uh, she could have been saved easily if it was dealt differently from the beginning. I think from the beginning, a lot of uh, local people got involved and they, the news spread widely in the country and then a lot of politicians got involved uh, and then a lot of international pressure was on the government and it is not easy for the government to handle when there's international pressure mm-hmm. and there's a pressure from the local fanatic groups. It's uh, always challenging. So I think these involvements and these different programs all over the world, although they were trying their best to raise voice for her, but it actually delayed the process and uh, ultimately uh, the poor lady, she has to spend, she had to spend nine years in the prison and finally she was released by the grace of God. And I think uh, we need to learn a lot from that. And uh, if something happens, there uh, is no way we should be shouting all around. And these days I feel so bad when people start sharing the videos on Facebook and YouTube. I think it's, uh, it's easy for the authorities in the country to deal the cases if they are not prominent and if they don't get viral. And if they get viral, I mean, recently there are two nurses, they have been uh, accused falsely uh, for the blasphemy in, in Pakistan. And they are, the very same day, I think it, the video of uh, uh, their persecution, they're beaten by the mob in the hospital, uh, spread all over the country, even in the world. And that uh, they, are in the, they are arrested and they are in police custody right now. To me, that is very scary, I think, for them, and it may delay the, the decision and uh, the process. So uh, that's how it happens, I think. One needs to take it very uh, softly and need to give time and then uh, uh, allow the right people to jump into it and solve it. Otherwise, it gets complicated. So sometimes it's better to sort of be behind the scenes having conversations with the authorities rather than 
like you say, it going viral and being on the internet and everyone in the world being able to see it, sometimes that actually makes it worse than making it better. I think I think it should be mostly the case, and uh, uh, because by spreading it, 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 I think it doesn't really help a lot. Uh, but when it 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 become a big case, then the international voices do create a pressure on the local authorities to solve it. But I think uh, the present government is pretty flexible, and they are uh, they are very uh, cooperative to the minorities, and they are trying their level best to solve their issues wisely and nicely. And I'm hoping that the recent case, I hope and my prayers that the present government will solve it very wisely and dig deep into the uh, things and find who is getting the problem for all this. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Brother Aaron. He is a gospel worker in Pakistan. Uh, Brother Aaron, what are some of the ways that Voice of the Martyrs is helping the church in Pakistan uh, to strengthen to strengthen the church and also to equip them uh, to reach the next generation? I think the first and foremost is the prayers, and I think that's what you guys have been doing for last many years. Uh, there, are, uh, there are a group of people, there are prayer warriors all over the world who are praying for Pakistan, and then that's what we need. When people pray and we people pray together, uh, God give more wisdom to people to deal the matters. Uh, and I think at the same time, uh, uh, Voice of the Martyr has been helping uh, churches in many ways by providing them with humanitarian uh, stuff. At the same time, uh, the gospel, the Bible, uh, the distribution of Bible in the country through different organizations and churches. And I think that's uh, making a huge difference because uh, people, they are they want to have their own Bible, and sometimes it's hard for them to go and purchase the Bible from the the, uh, the places where the Bibles are available, and I, I think in that case, the free Bible distribution is something they need it. And these days, uh, everyone wants to have their own privacy and own life, and they want their own book in their hand. I remember years back, people, even a one Bible in home would do this. Uh, do the job, but right now people want their own Bible. So I think that's uh, one of the best things uh, Voice of the Martyr is doing. And at the same time, I have seen them g- being involved in different programs like sporting pastors on and off with uh, with the basic needs they have, sporting uh, children and young people in the country, uh, with education supplies and other stuff, and helping different organizations to run the seminars and trainings for the disciple making. I think there are different level of ways Voice of the Martyr is helping in the country. But above all, I think one of the best things Voice of the Martyr, which they are called for, is helping the persecuted church, especially the areas where the persecution happens. That's where they try their level best to help those families to to be in a safe place and also help them to sustain their life and to help them to come out of the trauma for the whole community in that area. And that's, I think, one of the key elements. And I think that's where you guys are making a huge difference. And I pray that you will continue serving uh, the country like Pakistan in that way. Amen. I love it that you started out with prayer. And in a minute, I'm going to ask you how we can pray. Uh, but first, I want to ask, are there... Are there things that our listeners, primarily American Christians, maybe don't understand about Pakistan that that you can help us understand better so we understand the the country better so we can pray more effectively? Are are there things that you wish Americans knew about Pakistan that that most of us don't? Pakistan is a is a beautiful country. It's the best country I would say to travel and be there. I would say uh, one needs to go and visit Pakistan if they get opportunity. And uh, secondly, many times in the news globally, we always hear bad stuff for Pakistan. And people often think so every second person in the country is a terrorist or he, he is a bad guy. <laughs> that's, not the, that's not the case. I think Pakistan is a country where uh, it's a variation in different places. If you are in big cities, the things are different. In, you're in the villages, they're, they're different culture. And I think uh, uh, the door, as it's mentioned earlier, door is open, and one needs to be wise and needs to find different strategies to reach people. Uh, so I would say people in this part of the world, they need to uh, need take a, a positive picture of Pakistan and keep thinking that the door is open there. But at the same time, many times I have seen people in Western world, they, are, they take a lot of things as granted and they don't value 
a level of persecution and the price people pay for being faithful in those kind of countries. It, 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 it means a lot for them. Attending a church over there means a lot. Church buildings are very small. Sometimes there's no church building and people meet in, in the houses. So uh, sometimes some areas they don't feel uh, like it's easy for them to travel to church. So uh, I think there are different level of stuff going on. And here I see a lot of big churches, a lot of facilities. And I think uh, we need, need to be thankful for that. But at the same time, we need to uh, take care of our brothers and sisters who are uh, worshipping in that country. And I think we need to be supporting them in different ways. Uh, and that's how I think uh, uh, we need to be aware of what is happening in that country. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Brother Aaron. He is a gospel worker in Pakistan. Aaron, as we finish up, we always try to equip listeners to pray. So so I'm going to ask two prayer questions. First, for the Christians in Pakistan and the churches in Pakistan, how do we pray for them? Yeah, for the Christians in Pakistan, keep praying for them to be strong in the faith because uh Things are open right now, as I mentioned, but in, we never know in the coming days it will get tough and uh, hard for them to to keep the faith strong in the country. Keep praying for them and let uh, pray that they will be strong, bold believers in the country. Uh, for the churches, uh, I would say uh, the unity among churches, harmony among the churches is the key, and uh, the prayer is that they work together. And then my second prayer question is sort of broadening out to the country as a whole. The the majority people, the country as a whole, how do we pray for Pakistan? Yeah, we uh, uh, the country, as I said, it's a beautiful country, but ob- obviously we do face a lot of challenges on and off, uh, and especially instability in the government. Uh, that's one of the main issues we face, and that causes a lot of problem. So that's where the struggle is, and also... Poverty due to natural disasters in the country and the way they are affecting uh, different parts of the country. So keep praying for blessings for the country and keep praying for the majority community that they would understand that uh, uh, the Christians are peacemakers and they are not harming them. Rather, they are here to contribute their part for the nation and they are equivalent member, equivalent uh, part of the community and they are equal part of the country. Amen. We will pray. We will have listeners who will pray. Uh, Brother Aaron, is there is there anything else that you want our listeners to understand about uh, Pakistan, about gospel work there, about what ministry looks like in that country? Yeah, uh, maybe keep uh, praying that uh, God will raise more of local native uh, missionaries in the country because we need those. We are so thankful for the missionaries who traveled to, to our countries years ago and helped build a lot of things there. But now is the need that we need local initiative and native missionaries to jump up and take the burden And uh, because they understand the culture, they understand the language, they speak the language, they know how to deal it. And I think it's, uh, it will make things easier for them to take it uh, beyond the borders. So pray for that and maybe also uh, best pray for people that Pakistan uh, can become a country to send missionaries to different parts of the world. And that's what the church is hoping these days, how can we send missionaries from Pakistan to other parts of the world. Amen. Brother Aaron, thank you for your work. Uh, Thank you for your ministry. And thank you for being our guest this week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you. Our guest this week has been Brother Aaron. We altered his voice for his protection. If you missed any of our conversation, you can listen to all of it when you visit vomradio.net. Again, you can hear this episode as well as dozens of others that will give you a bigger heart for the world and especially for God's people living and serving in hostile and restricted nations. The web address again, vomradio.net. Next week, Bob Fu is going to join us. He'll talk about what is happening in China, the worst Christian persecution there since the time of the Cultural Revolution. And yet God is still at work in China, and Bob will help us remember that it is a spiritual battle, not a physical one. 
and he'll help us pray for God's people in China. I hope you'll be back next week for that conversation right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.